the will to win. The winning at all costs. It's got to be a careful balance. Comes with a price tag. This was certainly a strikeout. I'll take the responsibility for that. And it crossed the line. This is bullying. This is torture. This is uh, horrible ways to treat people. The fear. Finish it off. We all learned at the same time what was taking place at New Mexico State, and it wasn't pretty. Good evening, I'm Doug Fernandez. And I'm Shelly Rabando. Tonight, Target 7 special investigation, hazed, fear, and failure. What you will hear tonight is not going to be pleasant. Three New Mexico State University basketball players have been charged in connection with hazing their teammates. They're accused of bringing guns to the locker room and sexually assaulting other players. The university has already paid out more than $8 million to two of the five alleged victims. The accusations forced NMSU to cancel its season a year ago and start completely from scratch. Hazing is a problem occurring in athletic programs all over the country and universities are struggling to get it to stop. And tonight in a Target 7 special investigation, we're learning there were warning signs at New Mexico State. State laws are lacking and the university might have been focused too much on winning. Here is John Cardinelli. The beat of the basketball hitting the court beats along with the heart of fans. I still follow them. I watch them on TV every opportunity. And when it's game day, the dribbling of the ball brings life to the Pan American Arena in Las Cruces. New Mexico State is the only show in town. As the stands are filled with 12,000 proud Aggie fans. New Mexico State is, 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 has a good team. The community is happy. Basketball's big in Las Cruces. The Aggies have made it to the NCAA tournament 23 times, and in 1970, they made it to the Final Four. Up to the recent NCAA runs and winning in the NCAA tournament two years ago, uh, I'd say it's been the, you know, definitely the bell cow sport at New Mexico State. Mario Mocha is the athletic director at NMSU. Uh, he says because of the team's legacy, winning is expected. We know that we've pledged to make sure that the program is run clean and wins and bring prides to alums. Is there too much pressure to win? Yeah, look, I think everybody is trying to win every single game. Um, certainly winning is important. Us coaches' jobs are at stake, but we certainly always want to win with integrity. In six years, two coaches came through the program, won, and moved on to bigger things. We've had a great run of hires here. Paul Weir won 28 games for us. Weir moved on from NMSU to coach at the University of New Mexico. His replacement, Chris Jans, came to coach in 2017. Chris Jans was 128 and something, you know, constant going to the NCAA tournament. But Jans left following the 2022 season to coach at Mississippi State, and the program's winning ways needed to continue. Mocha, who's been in the position for nine years, chose Greg Heyer from Northwest Florida College. What goes into a coach is obviously a um, successful record. He certainly had that. Heyer had just won Junior College Coach of the Year, and on top of that, won the national championship. And everything that it takes to win NCAA tournament games is sitting right over there. Just give me a chance, and I promise I'll change your life. Go Aggies. And some would say... He came through on that promise. He imploded a program in six months. William Benjamin is the father of one of Hire's former players. He says the problem started with who Hire put in an Aggie uniform. If you know you're taking on these kids that have questionable backgrounds, whether they have felonies or whether even they have academic issues, it's your responsibility to, uh, to monitor those behaviors of those kids. Target 7 discovered when Hire started building his roster, he brought two players who had been convicted of felonies. Anthony Roy was convicted of drug dealing charges while playing basketball at a community college in Idaho. And Deshondre Washington, who pled guilty to two firearms charges in Illinois when he was 19. He also played with Hire at Northwest Florida State College. These are some of the players that would lead to Hire's quick downfall. New Mexico State had a rule that convicted felons could not play athletics, but that all changed five years ago. The rule was changed one month before former Aggie basketball player Terrell Brown pled to a felony assault charge. As far as the policy allowing convicted felons to play at NMSU, does that need to be changed? While I said uh, uh, 
a prospective student athlete with a felony could play basketball here or any other sport, that doesn't mean they would. Prior to the 22-23 season, NMSU didn't recruit any felons to its basketball team. We try to do as much due diligence as we can. We are certainly reliant on the coaches to tell us, hey, there is something in this individual's uh, background that you need to be aware of. We would then take that to the university. Um, to make sure that they are comfortable. It's unclear if Heyer notified the university. When asked, Mocha said he couldn't answer because of pending litigation. He did, however, say this. If we know it in advance, we would take that into consideration. The NCAA has no rules preventing players charged or convicted of felonies from playing collegiate athletics. Should the NCAA have rules? Uh, regarding this, I think it could be entirely appropriate. They have rules literally up until recently on how much an athlete could eat. So I think that saying that if somebody has a felony conviction, they are ineligible for college athletics because it's not a right, it's a privilege. Dr. David Ridpath is a professor of sports business at Ohio University and is considered an expert on NCAA rules and regulations. Sadly, what you see is institutions will overlook quite a bit uh, if that athlete is very talented and can help those teams win. So the responsibility there falls on the institution. When we return, someone was killed in November and we're talking about hazing in February, January. It got people's attention on an issue that is happening all around the country. So how much responsibility does the university take in what had happened? In the 2022-23 basketball season, New Mexico State University put two felons on their roster. Quickly, trouble followed. It started with a player killing another student while on a road trip. And it ended with unthinkable acts occurring inside the locker room. Once again, here's John Cardinelli. It's a guilt that many parents face. Sometimes I question myself, did I put my son in this situation? William Benjamin is a former Aggie. As a parent, your job is to provide for your kids and also to keep them safe. He was coaching his son Deuce at Las Cruces High School. Together, they won a state title. Did I do my job in keeping them safe? After his senior season, Deuce followed in his father's footsteps and became an Aggie. Did I put him in a bad situation? 
William Benjamin was inducted into the Aggies Hall of Fame, but since finding out what happened to his son, it's hard for him to come into this arena. But I'm not cool with being uncomfortable, you know, and I don't want to walk in someplace and feel uncomfortable. Deuce's freshman year was a nightmare. It's something William Benjamin can't talk about. He hired an attorney. I can only imagine the pain of having your scrotum grabbed and twisted violently. Jolene Youngers so represents the Benjamins. They reported what happened to the authorities and filed suit against the university. It was largely very humiliating, degrading behavior, being required to do everything that's a little less offensive, but nonetheless offensive, like being pantsed, having their private parts and their rear end hanging out, um, and being required to do squats. Deuce was one of five players who came forward and reported they were repeatedly hazed and sexually assaulted. They held this news conference. Slow down. Come on. Finish it up. Finish it up. Finish it up. I'm good. Finish it up. Being able to go through this pain isn't easy. As you can see. But all you can, all you can do is weather the storm. Shaq Odenwu is another player who came forward. It, it's just, it's just sad. It's just, it's just sad to see. Like never in a million years did I ever think that something like this was going to happen. Odin Wu also filed suit. Shaq alleged many of the same behaviors, but Shaq alleged an incident that was even more severe because he alleged that there was digital penetration of him during one of the attacks. And it's a matter that has seriously scarred him. After learning of the allegations, then University Chancellor Dan Arvizu canceled the rest of the basketball season. There have been some egregious violations of our student code of conduct, and there have been essentially other despicable acts. And the attorney general charged these three players with multiple counts of criminal sexual penetration, criminal sexual conduct, and false imprisonment. Kim Aiken Jr., Dr. Bradley, and Deshondre Washington, who was one of the felons we told you about earlier. To a certain extent, describing it only as hazing really does a disservice to the victims. This is, it includes allegations of not only physical violence, but, but sexual violence. Um, and if convicted, these defendants face a lengthy term of incarceration in state prison. It was in this locker room where much of the alleged hazing and sexual assaults occurred. For all of these acts to be happening in that locker room and no one did, it did anything to stop it. Including the Benjamins and Odenwu, a total of five players have filed suit. So far, the university has settled the suits brought forward by the Benjamins and Odenwu paying them a total of $8 million. It's an extremely large settlement, which reflects that something really terrible was happening here. So I think we, what we can take away from that is a recognition that, 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 that this was a bad situation and um, these people suffered significantly and this large amount of money reflects how badly they were damaged. KOAT legal expert John Day says he expects the university to pay even more to the alleged victims. The university and the state recognized that there's liability and that they have a lot of exposure and that if they went to trial, it's certainly possible that a jury would be so angry that they would award a figure that's much, much higher. But could all of this been prevented? Benjamin believes it could have been stopped months earlier if the university took more action following this deadly shooting. We already had a young man killed now. You know, we've already had a young man killed. You know, somebody's, somebody lost their child. You know what I mean? Somebody lost their child. In November 2022, months before the players came forward with hazing accusations, the Aggies were in Albuquerque. They were in town to face their rivals, the New Mexico Lobos. Several Aggies snuck out of the team hotel. Earlier, we introduced you to the university's athletic director. We had a complete and total lack of discipline in the program. One of them, Mike Peake, was trying to meet a girl when he was ambushed. 
A gunfight ensued, and UNM student Brandon Travis was killed. Some of Peek's teammates met up with him and took his gun, cell phone, and tablet. What followed was a bizarre series of events that led the New Mexico State Police to run lights and sirens to stop the team bus as it headed back to Las Cruces. <laughs> Investigators were looking for the items Peek's teammates took. Hire sent out an assistant coach while he sat in the bus. I didn't know you guys were leaving. I thought you these three players, including Anthony Roy, another felon we told you about earlier, were suspended just one game as a result of that incident. Roy was one of the players that showed up and took Peek's gun. Hire was allowed to coach. When we asked the university why, they said it was because the investigation into the shooting was ongoing and Hire retained an attorney. If you know you're taking on these kids that have questionable backgrounds, whether they have felonies or whether even they have academic issues, it's your responsibility to, uh, to monitor those behaviors of those kids. Eventually, the season went on, and according to the plaintiffs, so did the hazing. Is there anything you would have done differently? I would have hired a different basketball coach. I don't say that to be flippant. We told you earlier how Heyer won the junior college national title and was named coach of the year in 2022. But Heyer had past problems himself. He had been arrested for DWI, and while at Northwest Florida State wow. College, he was known for bringing in athletes who had troubled pasts. Has it had a successful uh, history with basketball? Yes, because they take all comers. So how much evaluation and how much scrutiny was being done of the players on those teams? And that culture is different than what we hope in New Mexico is a culture for inviting student athletes to play here for our state schools. I think I was one of the first to say there is a culture of hazing that is likely existing within that group. Dr. Ann Goodman is New Mexico State University's Dean of Students. She says she was addressing the hazing issue on campus long before the incident involving the basketball team. For me, I was very disappointed, but it was also a time and a place to start talking about hazing again. She helped establish the university's anti-hazing policies. She says the school gets about two to three complaints a semester. The policy itself was always in place. Um, the prevention and conversation, the education of others with regards to what is hazing, what is appropriate behavior, what is not appropriate behavior is something that we have taken a more significant and intentional stance on. So how much responsibility does the university take in what had happened? At the end of the day, the individuals that were involved in the behaviors made their own choices. Policies and trainings would not necessarily have prevented something from that. So I don't know that we can take 100% responsibility. When we return. They felt like, aren't we hazing? Wouldn't we need to stop our culture if that's the case? We have to draw a hard line that there's absolutely zero hazing and zero tolerance. Whenever you're, you're doing something against a person's will, I think that definitely crosses the line. What is hazing and what constitutes crossing the line? It's something many have trouble defining. What we do know is three former New Mexico State basketball players have been criminally charged with crossing that line, and two of them had troubled past before they became Aggies. Could this have been prevented if the state had certain laws? Once again, here's John Cardinelli. So when did you come here to NMSU? Uh, 2018. Sitting across from an old classroom, what kind of drew you to, to the campus here? It's closer to home. I wanted to be close to my family. Jonathan Sias is reflecting on his time in college. So what fraternity did you pledge? It was a uh, Kappa Sigma. A decision that caused him a traumatic experience uh, really and shed light on the problem of hazing at NMSU. I didn't know that there was going to be a lot of hazing involved. I didn't know because I didn't go to the initial events before what happened to me. While pledging the fraternity, Sias was pulled aside and asked to turn around during an event for new members to be initiated. I pulled the gun out and I turned around like, 
I'm obviously frantic when I see the gun. He's waving it around. He points it all over my body. So I walk away and then he, pull, he put it on my thigh and then he pulled the trigger. And what did that feel like when you got shot? I was just a little bit in shock initially when I got shot. But then after that, I came to the realization that I had a hole in my leg. Sias was taken to the hospital and rushed into surgery. The bullet just missing a major artery in his leg. I could have possibly lost my life on the mountain. NMSU decided to kick the fraternity off campus for five years after learning about what happened to Sias. The person who shot him pled to aggravated assault and negligent use of a deadly weapon. What did you think when you heard about what was going on with the basketball team? That nobody's learning, nobody's trying to change anything. I mean, it's still what they're doing. It's criminal. Hazing is criminal. But in New Mexico, hazing is not criminal. We join Alaska, Hawaii, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Montana as the only states without any hazing law. And those who've been affected by hazing say that needs to change. There are 12 other states that have made it a felony if the hazing results in death, or in the case of Sias, serious bodily injury. It's a little frustrating. I, mean, I think we need to catch up. I think we need to catch up. New Mexico was trying to catch up. Last legislative session, three different bills were proposed in the roundhouse that would have made the smallest forms of hazing a misdemeanor and felonies for the serious cases. You know, having someone join an organization and you're like, well, you need to learn our song. You need to be able to take this quiz. You need to be able to recite the leaders in this organization. That's not hazing, that's kind of, you know, a process or initiation. Democrat Senator Harold Pope was one of three bipartisan legislators who proposed new laws. When you start doing harm physically or mentally to someone, and especially if it's long lasting, that's really the line for me. But the bills failed. Legislators told us that the hazing laws did not pass because they were having difficulty defining exactly what it was. Republican Representative Joshua Hernandez proposed his own bill. One of the things that came up in Judiciary Committee is that it needed to be more clearly defined. And I, you know, I, in retrospect, I agree with that. You know, when we realize that 44 other states have already gone through this process and they've adopted laws that address what hazing is, whatever the definition is, that the general concept is the same. The problem of hazing has reached the national level. The U.S. Center for Safe Sport is an organization that currently oversees 55 sports programs that feed into the Olympic program. It was founded by Congress following the USA Gymnastics sexual assault scandal involving Larry Nassar. When that happened, the nation was just appalled and outraged, and so was Congress. And so it felt the need to establish an independent entity to finally provide some oversight and some accountability to the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. Jerice Colon is the CEO of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. She says they have the power to force coaches and players to take training, and they can suspend coaches and ban them for life. We're certainly bound by the law as to who we can investigate, right, which is what kind of ties our hands a little bit. However, they do not have any jurisdiction over college athletics, including the NCAA. Recently, there have been congressional hearings to give them that power. Over at NMSU, they've defined hazing and have pushed for anti-hazing laws. What is hazing? A behavior that people go along with um, or they may choose not to go along with, but people cannot consent to be hazed, to be endangered, to be humiliated. Earlier, we introduced you to Dr. Ann Goodman. She's New Mexico State University's Dean of Students. She lobbied for the legislation. None of them passed. How do you feel about that? I think it is the result of people not understanding what hazing is. I think we've seen in the states where it has been adopted, they can actually identify this behavior and equate it to something more than just the standard college prank. It becomes something that is serious that can, can end up harming an individual. New Mexico State University is not alone when it comes to severe hazing allegations. Athletic programs at Boston College and Northwestern University dealt with hazing allegations last year as well. Schools like to handle their own business themselves. Uh, they certainly don't want to have any bad publicity. That's the one thing that colleges and universities 
try to avoid more than anything. Ohio University professor Dr. David Ridpath is an expert on NCAA rules. Colleges and universities need to be much more proactive with regards to hazing and bullying in athletics. New Mexico State University has adopted what they call action items to address hazing. One of them requires the university to talk to all men's and women's athletic programs. In addition to conducting multiple investigations, they also joined the National Hazing Prevention Consortium, require all students and staff to undergo online anti-hazing training, and also lobbied for those laws we told you about that failed in the legislature. But many are not satisfied, and they say athletic director Mario Mocha should be held responsible. So what happens to Mario Mocha's contract after allegations of hazing emerge? Well, what's fairly incredible is that he ends up getting a significant raise. Significant indeed. Mocha's initial raise took his salary up $70,000 to $351,000 a year, and it continues to go up until 2027. The deal was signed off by then Chancellor Dan Arvizu on his last day at the school. In May, the Higher Education Department sent this letter to New Mexico State saying, quote, Given the heinous nature of the incidents that occurred under Director Mocha's tenure, state funds should not be applied toward his salary. Since then, his pay has been covered by the athletic department's boosters. What's your response to the critics out there? We had three outside investigations, and those, those, um, um, those uh, results are proven in writing. And then we have put together, I think, a very aggressive team to pretty much um, be the gold standard as far as uh, hazing is concerned with intercollegiate athletics department and maybe even the university. Additionally, the university's faculty senate sent a letter stating the school's decision to keep Mocha was, quote, astonishing and deeply disheartening, and that the athletic department was single-handedly responsible for diminishing NMSU's reputation on a national level over the past year. Who do you feel is responsible for what happened? I certainly have strong feelings on your question. I just won't answer him at this time. Do you feel Mario Mocha should still be the athletic director at NMSU? Not for me to say. You know, that's, that's none of my business. That's none of my business. As for Greg Heyer, he has publicly said he knew nothing about the hazing allegations while he was coaching. He claims to be a scapegoat. Target 7 reached out to Heyer. We've yet to hear back. Since leaving Las Cruces, he was hired as the coach of the Mineral Area College basketball team, a community college in Missouri. What do you think about that? Amazing. It's amazing. Somebody hired him. You know, it's amazing. He got a job in less than six months. Hire has had a lot of success at his new job. This season, he won 29 games and lost three. There is certainly no premium uh, that's more than winning at a lot of places around the country. It underscores how much winning is important, almost um, to the point of that's the most important thing, um, and not maybe taking other things into consideration. As for the rest of the Aggies who played for hire, they're all gone. They got rid of everybody, coaching staff, players, videographer, they got rid of everybody, man. <laughs> like However, some have found new homes, including those at the center of the allegations. Kim Aiken Jr. is playing professional basketball in Europe. Dr. Bradley was playing at Nichols State and was later dropped after charges were filed. And Deshondre Washington is playing in the Shy League, a pro-am league sponsored by Wilson. As for William Benjamin's son, Deuce, one of the victims we introduced to you earlier, he's now playing at New Mexico Junior College in Hobbs. Everyone's not gonna be a professional basketball player. And while being a basketball player is a dream for many, for some, a more realistic dream has now been taken away by the ripple effects of what happened behind these locker room doors. Everyone is not gonna bounce back from this situation. And I'm talking about kids, and coaches. You know, a lot of kids missed out on an opportunity to get an education, you know? Not everyone got picked up to go play basketball in college. What is the solution to stopping hazing? With the proper education, the proper leadership in place and understanding the importance of people's boundaries. Um, and, and also and by implementing laws to let people know that this isn't, it's not acceptable behavior. 
Research shows about 55% of college students involved in club teams or organizations are hazed every year. But rarely they get reported. Experts told our Target 7 team if someone feels they're getting hazed, they should report it, refuse to participate, and connect with others going through the same thing. Many schools across the country have hazing hotlines. Unfortunately, in New Mexico, we were unable to find a school with a dedicated hazing hotline. From all of us at KOAT, good night.